Good morning. Good morning. Good to gather. It's the First Presbyterian Church to worship the Lord uh, this morning. It's good to be back with you. The answer is yes and no. Yes, we had a good time on vacation. No, we did not relax. There was 40 of us from eight months to in their 80s. It was a busy time. Good. So our call to worship comes from the 62nd Psalm, beginning at verse 5. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we sing about that strong foundation, that rock, that fortress who is our God. How firm a foundation, number 408. Uh, and that song remind us that we belong to the Lord, that we are in his strong grip and there is safety, security, and blessing in that, in that grip. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the strong, firm foundation that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you that you hold us as your own in all times and through all things. We thank you that both our salvation from first to last depends on you, and we can count on you. And likewise, our honor, our glory, our name, our reputation depends on you, and we can entrust it to you whatever others may say. And so, Lord, in that confidence, help us to worship, not only as we gather together for public worship, but as we dispense from here to worship you every moment, every day, 
that our thoughts would continually ascend to you, whether in prayer or thanksgiving or requests or just being aware that we are yours and that nothing can change that, not even the powers of hell, as we sang in our song. We rest in you. We worship you. We delight in you. And we pray together now, as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, we are. I uh, want to pray for Reed Thayer. He is preaching this morning up at uh, the uh, church in uh, Chapel by the Sea. And so we're thankful for that opportunity for him. As we pray together, I want to pray for uh, uh, Gary Hookstra as he continues to recover from uh, uh, leg surgery this past week. Uh, we rejoice with uh, Jake and Lonnie Goddard at the birth of... Uh, their daughter, Llewellyn Ann, and we rejoice with uh, Jason and Tiffany Goddard, uh, the baptism of Llewellyn's cousin, uh, which will be at the 11 o'clock service, Marilise Elizabeth, and so some good things there. We have folks facing and dealing with cancer in various stages and uh, difficulties, and we want to pray for them uh, uh, and pray through the week for them as they are dealing with these difficulties. Uh, for Roger Wilburn, uh, 
uh, the 11 o'clock service, plays in the praise team, and had a back injury, and will be having surgery this week. And we rejoice uh, with uh, Mike and Ardeth Matisi uh, celebrating a 68th anniversary, uh, and with uh, Howie and Laura Koops celebrating a 60th anniversary. Uh, and so those are good things. Uh, Mike and Ardeth will be with us one more week, and then they're moving back to Michigan. They said, it's just too hot in Florida. <laughs> and then after 30 years, they're just not used to it. <laughs> we will miss them. But uh, so make a uh, point to reach out to them this week, and uh, we're thankful. Let's pray. O oh God, who is the shield and defense of all who flee to you, be to us, we pray, a tower of strength and a place of refuge and a rest in your everlasting arms. Grant to us dispositions of mind and heart to ever contend fearlessly for truth and honor. And set the seal of your love upon us as we lift our voices of gratitude for the abounding supply of your rich reservoirs of mercy and goodness. We thank you for that. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for dwelling too often on the things we do not have, and not caring and stopping to thank you for the blessings we do have, especially the countless blessings we have in Christ, who forgives our sins, who restores our peace, who grants abundant life and places of service which are useful and needful. Fill our hearts with such grace that nothing will be able uh, to beat us down, but that we would endure and press on. And forgive us if we've been sullen and fretful in the midst of our duties in the midst of the crushing loads that the world and life can bring. Lord, you are greater than these. As you've been mindful of us, O oh Lord, be mindful of our young people. We pray and rejoice with the Goddard family and a new um, baby in their world and, uh, and now the adoption of, and the uh, baptism of Amerilise. We pray for all of the children of our congregation. We pray for the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of our families. And we ask you to look graciously with your favor upon them, that they may grow in wisdom. They may grow in glorifying and enjoying you in usefulness. and engagement. Preserve them from all sin. Keep them pure in heart, upright in life, and busy with the work of the Lord. We ask you to enable us to look to you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We may go from strength to strength, and at last, having finished the course and kept the faith, receive from you the crown of life that will never fade away. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gave himself for us, who rose again from the dead on the third day, and who reigns from heaven even now. Amen. Stand together in doxology. Thank you.
Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Pray with me. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, who in all ages has preserved your church, we come to you now in humility and in gratitude to acknowledge your goodness to us, not according to our deserving, but you have blessed us according to your grace and your infinite goodness. And as we present our tithes and offerings to you, may we give ourselves as well in renewal to you as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll be singing from the Psalter 182, a psalm that asks God to revive us. encourage you to be super welcoming to the couple that are worshiping with us for the first time this morning. I know that they're great people because their son's name is Drew. <laughs> and then uh, my, my answers are yes and no. It has nothing to do with Pastor Ray being on vacation. A number of you have asked how our new grandson is doing. Uh, week two, uh, the yes is we're having a blast. Uh, so there's the fun part. Um, relaxing, uh, not exactly. Um, their uh, parents, my daughter and son-in-law, their house is leaking in Lake Wales, so they've been living with us. And so again, lots of fun, but not necessarily relaxing. Uh, but he's a real joy. Well, we are back in our series in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and so I would encourage you, uh, either with the Bible that you brought with you, 
old school paper or on your phone or on the screen or in front of you in the pew. Um, we'll be starting with uh, Matthew 22, 34, reading through the end of the chapter. Uh, before we read, pray uh, with me. Uh, Father, we uh, again thank you for the privilege to gather together as your people uh, to worship you. And certainly, um, the best thing about coming together to worship you is to be looking at your word uh, together. We thank you that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us in a way that we can understand. Um, we thank you for uh, your word, and we pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would be our teacher this morning and that you would cause us to be teachable, that we would be humble, that we'd be hungry and thirsty and that we be open to whatever your message is to each one of us. Do that miracle once again. Meet us where we are and give us what we need, um, knowing that what you think we need is the absolute best. And all God's people said, Amen. Uh, this is God's word. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? He said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put my enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. May the Lord bless the reading and understanding, application, proclamation of his word. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were religious leaders in Jesus' day, and they were utter uh, rivals, and they were constantly squabbling, squabbling over various doctrinal beliefs. But the two groups had one thing in common. They absolutely had a disdain for Jesus Christ. They were jealous of his popularity. They were fearful of losing their authority and power. And they really disliked the fact that he had a knack for getting under their skin and for pointing out their hypocrisy. Just before this morning's passage, the text tells us that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees regarding their question about marriage and the resurrection. The Pharisees were up to the plate now, positioning themselves to take a swing at Jesus. One of their own, a lawyer, asked a question to test him. He asked, what is the greatest commandment? Interestingly, Jesus seemed to be favorable to the question because he did not call the man a hypocrite as he did uh, a different questioner in verse 18. In addition, in the account of this uh, conversation in Mark 12, Jesus referred to our questioner as both wise and someone not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus' answer is worthy of our study. Our first takeaway is this. Love is a great summary of the Christian faith. Love is a great summary of the Christian faith. As a husband, I've read uh, plenty of books on godly marriage. I've attended a number of conferences. And now, admittedly, I, I'm a simple man, but if I hear an author say, or I hear a speaker say, the key to being a good husband is these things. 
But if these things are more than three things, I'm lost and sunk. That's why I always smile when I read Jesus' answer to the lawyer's question. His answer is this, the whole duty of man, the whole spiritual moral law, the whole path to walking as a follower of Jesus can be summed up in one word, love. Jesus' answer gives us a laser-focused target, one that has broad and life-changing applications. You see, love is the peg on which the entire Old Testament with its commandments, covenants, and promises hangs. That's what it tells us in verse 40. According to our passage, this love should first be directed to God, and then it should be directed to our fellow man. So first, we must love God. Verse 37 would not have been anything new to the Jews, for it is almost an exact quote of Deuteronomy 6.5. Both of those verses are an umbrella uh, or a summary of the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments, which are all about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. The language of verse 37 teaches us at least two things. One, our love for God should involve all the faculties that God has given us. We are called to love Him with all our heart, the very hub of the wheel of our existence, the wellspring of our thoughts, words, and deeds. We are to love him with all our soul, the very seat of our emotions. We are to love him with all our mind, referring not only to our intellect, but also to our disposition and attitudes. Two, our love for God should also be to the fullest, you note in the text the triple alls. Our love for him is not to be halfway, but instead all in. And the question is, why should our love for God be all-encompassing? Why should it be all in? Because brothers and sisters in Christ, that is how God has loved each one of us. All of his character traits Grace, mercy, forgiveness, holiness, justice, righteousness, power, and wisdom are saturated in his love. All of his promises to never leave us nor forsake us, to provide all of our needs, to be strong when we are weak, to turn ashes into beauty, to be near the brokenhearted, all of these and more flow from his love. And God's love for his people is certainly all in. He could have waited for us to turn back to him. Instead, he sent his only son down to us, sacrificing him on the cross, paying off the punishment and wrath that our rebellion against him justly deserved. All so that we could be reconciled to him and adopted into his family. Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 32, God did not spare his own son, Jesus, but gave him up for us all. Putting some flesh on the bone, what should our love for God look like? Well, first, loving God requires a disciplined effort to get to know him better. How wrong it would be if I said, to my wife, I really love you, but now that we've been together for 36 years, I'm not interested in getting to know you any better. Pastor A, I may need some marriage counseling. It would be vastly wrong to treat God in the same way. Should we not long to spend time with the Lord in prayer And in his word, hear me, church, the more we know God, the more we understand who he is, the more we understand what he has done, the more we understand what he continues to do, the more in love that we fall with him. And the more in love we become with him, the more we want to know him. 
Second, loving God means a commitment to making him first in our lives. In Revelation 2, 4, Jesus admonished the church in Ephesus for having lost their first love. Have we done the same? You see, in our lives, God deserves to be the main course, not some mere add-on or spice or seasoning. He's not looking to be a side gig or a side hustle. Abundant life is in making him the central hub of our personal world, not one of many spokes. It's in making him our all in all. The biggest challenge to God being first in our lives is idols, people, possessions, positions, passions, our own comfort. And none of those things are in of themselves bad, but they become idols when they capture and consume our hearts and minds more than the Lord does. The remedy, constantly asking the Holy Spirit to expose our idols, to lead us to conviction and repentance and to empower us to diligently root them out of our lives, replacing our false loves with love for the true God. Third, loving God means glorifying him with every aspect of our lives our words and tone, our pleasures and fun, our marriage, parenting, and grandparenting, our work and our retirement, our time and finances, our studies, our friendships, our driving, question mark. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Fourth, loving God should lead us to obey him. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our willingness to obey God is a fruit and a proof of our love for him, trusting that his ways are best. Fifth, loving God should compel us to tell others about him. Psalm 78, 4 speaks of the importance of of telling the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, his might, and the wonders he has done. Psalm 105, 1 and 2 encourages us to make known the deeds of God among the nations, telling them of all his wondrous works. For the past two weeks, to anybody, everybody, everywhere, I have been bragging about the new love in my life, my grandson, Bennett, sharing stories, showing pictures, chasing people down <laughs> at a much higher level. Shouldn't our love for our Heavenly Father compel us to share him with others? By God's grace, may our love for him resonate with what Vanya Thomas, a world witness missionary to Germany, recently wrote. The Lord is real relational, and living. He's not just theology or a way of life. He needs to be the most important person in my life. I want to know him so intimately that I can talk about him as naturally as I talk about my husband and my kids. May I, may you, and may our churches see the Lord as so worthy that we are willing to lay down whatever he calls us to lay down for his sake and his glory. Jesus' summary of the great commandment doesn't stop with loving God. We also must love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Again, verse 39 would have not been a new idea to the Jews either. It's an exact quote of Leviticus 19.18 from the Old Testament. And just like um, the first commandment was an umbrella, so is this one, an umbrella for the latter six commandments of the Ten Commandments, all about our relationship with one another. What does this second 
greatest commandment look like? The language as yourself sounds selfish, but it's not. Jesus said in seven, uh, John 7, 12, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Also in Matthew 5, 43 to 44, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If we are to love our enemies, how much more should we love our neighbors? In Colossians 3, 12 to 13, the apostle Paul penned, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving him as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You see, our love for our neighbors should flow for how God has loved us and from our love for him. 1 John 4, 19 to 21 says, We love others because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. But this begs the question, who is your neighbor? To start with, your neighbor is the person or the people that are sitting next to you or sitting around you. So right now, I want you to turn to them and say, Howdy, neighbor. <laughs> All right, that's enough fun. <laughs> if you don't know your neighbor, I encourage you after the service to spend some time getting to know them. Your neighbor also includes all your family members, certainly those who live near you, those next door, those across the street. Those are your neighbors. In reality, day in and day out, everyone who crosses your path is your neighbor. The person you see at the grocery store, the gym, the medical office, where you get your hair cut, the person in your class, all those people, hear me on this, all those people are not in your life based upon chance. Rather, they are in your life because the Lord has sovereignly put them in your life. So the question for all of us is this, what are we doing to love our neighbors? Perhaps for the first time, or perhaps to love them at a deeper level. It takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes intentionality. Because here's the thing. It's hard to genuinely love someone if what? You don't know them. Here's something else really important. We don't get to pick and choose which neighbors we love. Believe me, I understand how tempting that is. Over the years, I too have been stretched by some of my neighbors, Pastor Ray and his family, and then Pastor Tim and his family, and now Monty Dowling. Just kidding. I love them all. We must remember this truth. Every neighbor is made in God's image. There are no oops. There are no mistakes. We don't have the option to love neighbors who are easier to love. The ones that are more like us. The ones that are less messy. The ones that will take less effort and time. And so open your eyes. Look for ways to bless others. Look for ways to serve your neighbors. Notice the needs of others. And then put your love into action. Our final takeaway from this passage 
is this. Jesus is Lord. At first glance, it might seem that verses 43 to 46 are not connected at all to what we've talked about already. However, I would submit that these two sections are part of the same conversation. In verse 42, Jesus turned the table on the Pharisees by asking them a question. Not just any question, but the most important question of all. He says, what do you think about the Christ and whose son is he? The religious leaders answered, Christ is the son of David. Jesus then, quoting Psalm 110 verse 1, questioned them, how can this be the case since King David also called Christ Lord? Clearly, the Pharisees were stumped. Jesus' point was this. The title, Son of David, emphasized the humanity of Jesus. The title, Lord, emphasized the divinity of Jesus. In other words, Jewish religious leaders, Jesus is not just a man. He's not just totally a man. He is totally God. He is divine. He is God in the flesh. This truth brings our passage full circle. Since Jesus is God, the greatest commandment is to love him. Implicitly, Jesus is asking the Pharisees, what are you going to do with me? Now that you know I'm totally man and totally God. What are you going to do with me? How are you going to respond to me? Will you love me? And that's also the question for each one of us. How will we respond to Jesus? If you're here this morning and you you have already trusted in Jesus Christ as the forgiver of your sins and the leader of your life, hallelujah and praise the Lord. But if you are are not at that place, if you have not yet taken that step, I strongly encourage you to take that step today. Today is the day of salvation. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So love God and then love your neighbor. But hear me, church, there's no better way to love your neighbor than to tell them about who? To tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the incredible difference that he makes in your daily life. It's not just about being friendly. It includes that. It's about offering them Jesus who has changed your life and will change their life for the best forever. Amen and amen. Pray with me. Father, we admit that without your help, without your power, without your grace, without your Holy Spirit, we cannot love you as we should cannot love Jesus as we should. We cannot love your Holy Spirit like we should. We can't love our neighbors like we should. And so, Father, do that work in our life. Well up that, that love for our Creator and our, our Redeemer, for our friends and our family and our coworkers. Father, open our eyes to just how much you have loved us and continue to love us. And Father, as we grow in our love with you, that that love would splash over onto others. And Father, you would do the miracle and draw us closer to yourself and draw those who do not yet know you to yourself. And we will give you all the praise. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for him response, joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
This is God's blessing from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.